I'm Kurt Suter, I'm the Aviation Safety Officer. Um, aviation is one of the only branches that have safety officers signed by position and that's their primary duty. Um, so what I'm gonna go over today is uh, safety statistics and kind of try and make it so it's relevant to you guys. All right, next slide please. So here's our agenda. Uh, go over the introduction. I'm gonna tell you how we classify Army aviation or mishaps throughout the Army. Gonna go over the uh, old calendar year, fiscal year, uh, Army mishaps. Kind of what's the point of all this? Um, go over some of the aviation K429 mishaps. Uh, and then uh, for the relevancy, I pulled two uh, range accidents that happened because I think they apply to the infantry and the MPs as much as possible. And then uh, I want to go over foreign object debris, which is something that I want all passengers who might fly in a Blackhawk to know and understand. All right. Uh, if you have any questions at any time, just let me know. Next slide, please. All right. Uh, that's my contact information. Uh, as you can see, in aviation, we're required that every company has a safety officer and NCO. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I leave this slide up here because my goals, I'm new at being a safety officer. I've been in 31 years, uh, 29 of which I was a aviation maintainer or test pilot. <clears throat> uh, so my whole career, I've seen, I've felt that uh, the safety program was just kind of check the block crap. And I always resented it for that. It got in the way of us fixing helicopters, so I always hated that. So when I became a safety officer, I wanted to figure out what I didn't like about the safety program and try and make it relevant and timely and not take up too much time. Uh, Cause I felt that was important to get buy-in to the program. And it would show you that we respect your time and your energies. All right, next slide please. So this is how the Army classifies mishaps because we don't call them accidents. <clears throat> so class A, B, and C are very important and get reported to, uh, they call it the Combat Readiness Center. You guys probably know it as a safety center, but I, they went with Combat Readiness Center. Uh, I guess because it's more macho and feels more war fighty. <clears throat> so a class A mishap is any mishap that ends in a soldier's death or if it uh, results in their permanent disability, uh, causes damage that's greater, equal to or greater than 2.5 million, or if it destroys an entire aircraft because there are some aircraft that are worth less than 2.5 million, even though they're getting fewer and fewer. <clears throat> a class B mishap is an, a mishap that results in permanent disability or permanent partial disability. Uh, results in a hospitalization for three or more individuals, or uh, the cost figure is $600,000. Class C, uh, and Cs and Ds are what I want you guys as non-aviation people to really focus on because they're happening here um, and they're not getting reported. Um, they are getting reported by aviation, but unlike infantry and MPs, we have what's called an aviation resource management survey. Basically, First Army comes and inspects aviation every two to three years and holds our feet to the fire. There's 10 subsections of that. If we fail safety, then the entire program fails. So that's how seriously in aviation they take safety. Um, so these C's and D's, what I want you to take away from this is, uh, let's see. Did a mishap result in a non-fatal injury or occupational illness resulting in one or more days away from work or uh, work or training beyond the day of the shift in which it occurred? So any softball injury where the guy breaks a bone and is away in the hospital for a day or away from work for more than one day is a class C injury and must be reported. Similarly, class D is if the mishap resulted in a soldier who is now on restricted duty for more than a day. 
So I know those are happening just based on what I see at the beer garden. All right, <clears throat> Class E's are mishaps that result in damage less than $25,000. And Class F's are FOD, that's aviation only. Next slide, please. So fiscal year 21 just closed out. All right, so I want to bring up a, all right, so you can kind of take FY20 and FY19, kind of throw them out the window because of COVID. Uh, we just weren't doing what we standard we do on a normal year. But what I want to call to your attention here is we lost 286 soldiers last year. 181 of them were suicide. So please, key leaders, keep an eye on your troops, keep an eye on yourselves, kind of recognize all that behavior. That's why the Army is so focused on it. Two-thirds of the soldiers we lost last year were for suicide. <clears throat> now, of the mishaps, the 105 uh, soldiers who died in mishaps, two-thirds of those were uh, personally owned motor vehicles. Okay, so the most dangerous thing that your soldiers do when you're home is drive to and from drill. All right, next slide, please. All right, so like I said, oops, that was me. You can kind of throw FY20 out the window because of COVID. <clears throat> you can see though, we're trending down and that's the goal here is to reduce the amount of mishaps and fatalities. Next slide, please. All right, what's the point? What's the point? Why do we collect all this data? Okay, you are all probably familiar with the risk assessment matrix where you identify the hazard, you analyze it, you develop controls, implement the controls, and then you see how the controls worked, and it's just that cycle of life, all right? So what we do in the safety world is what we just talked about with the FY data is the assessment phase. They're looking for trends because they wanna see, number one, we wanna eliminate any hazard we can because if we do that, then we, that risk goes from 100% to zero. Uh, substitution, can we do something differently in any phase of this that will reduce the likelihood of that mishap. Engineering controls are like banisters that keep soldiers from falling off stairs and, and such like that. Uh, administrative controls are the orders and the SOPs that your leadership puts in place, all right? Now, the hierarchy of controls are because of the effectivity, effectiveness of the controls put in place because we kind of expect the last level of control is PPE. We anticipate that soldiers aren't going to always use the PPE like they're instructed. They may listen to administrative controls if the leaders are out there enforcing them. All right, next slide, please. All right, so like I just talked about, uh, what's killing us? PMV, uh, personally owned motor vehicles. All right, indiscipline, uh, alcohol, and young people. That's what kills us. If you're under 24 and you're driving at night and you had a couple, your risk goes through the roof. Uh, if you ride a motorcycle, I've been on four deployments. Uh, every deployment I've been on once we return, a soldier loses a life or a limb when they go out and buy a motorcycle they're not ready for. Uh, you can talk to any experienced guy, they're probably, divorce and motorcycles are killers when you return home. Just be aware of it. Next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, so I tried to bring up, these are called preliminary loss reports. Anytime a mishap happens, um, the safety officer sends in a quick report of what happened. Um, so it's just the facts, there's no analysis. It's for trend identification. So this one I chose um, because it's an AGR soldier from South Carolina on a Saturday night. Uh, 
wrapped his truck around a tree and died. Okay? They suspect alcohol and speeding. Uh, personally owned weapons. There were four fatalities from personally owned weapons. Uh, most of them were young guys in the barracks. Uh, this particular private first class had a couple drinks, was showing off the gun he just purchased, and inadvertently shot himself in the head. Next slide, please. So the PLRs also back up those trends. You know, 56% of all deaths for personally owned vehicles. Uh, motorcycles are 80 and 124 for cars. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. In motorcycles, what is a fender bender and a Yugo is fatal in a motorcycle many times. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what the, these are the controls that the, the Army Safety Center has developed. You know, check your soldiers. Are you getting enough adequate sleep? Are you abusing scripts? No. Slow down. Wear a seatbelt. That reduces your chance of a fatal injury by 45%. Um, if you wear a helmet when you ride a motorcycle, you've just increased the chances of your survival by 37%. Next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, so remember I was talking about uh, reporting injuries. This is aviation only because uh, these are the last five K4 rotations. Track personal injury by month, okay? So you'll notice here I circled July, August, and September. <clears throat> and anybody, I, th this is what happens, what we get most in the summertime. This is my second rotation at K4. What we get most in the summertime are injuries from playing sports, softball especially. Uh, I think touch football is probably going to drive that up. I see you smiling. I know you've got soldiers that probably got hurt. <laughs> right. So, but here's something you may not have anticipated. Um, in November and December, and a little bit in January, um, is this, has anyone been to K4 before? Okay. So, our, where we live, our sea huts, they can't clear the snow. Um, so, the pass going to the chow hall or the PX become compacted ice and people will fall on their butts left and right. And I'm hoping that uh, Captain Steele, he's a physical therapist here, will kind of go over this and maybe show you that, you know, the, you have to try and not brace yourself when you fall because that's a clear way to break your wrists. And you can see the statistics back, back that up. So it's coming, be aware of it. Next slide, please. So like I said, this is what I've learned. Um, sports injuries, sports are great for, for mental health. So, I mean, we do not want to not play sports. What I'm hoping is that you guys as grownups will realize no one gives a heck by uh, who carries home the K4 trophy. I was here for K420, no one remembers, all right? No one here is turning pro, all right? So it doesn't matter if there's 364 days left until hockey tryouts, all right? So since we arrived 18 June, since our HODU, um, we've had two Class Cs and one Class D in softball. We've had two Class Cs, broken bones in basketball. Um, both was from, from trying to steal the ball or block a shot. <clears throat> um, we actually, we would have two Class Ds for ACFT prep, uh, but uh, First Sergeant was put on res restricted duty and what do First Sergeants do? They work a computer all day, so he's, he didn't miss a day of work. All right, next slide. All right, I just throw this slide up just as a reminder. Ask, care, escort if you have someone who's feeling low. Next slide, please. All right, so this is what you could take away as NCOs and leaders, all right? This is the JRAT, all right? So if you're, uh, next slide please. This is a way to get a risk assessment done in about 15 minutes and use lessons learned from previous uh, users, all right? So you go to the Safety Center website, you scroll down until you hit JRAT, 
You launch JRAT, next page. Log in with your CAC, next page. All right, you select your mission. For this example, I picked range operations. All right, so next slide. That'll bring you up to vignettes you can use or you create a new deliberate risk assessment uh, worksheet right there. All right, so it brings you up to the new form and picking up the ammo. All these things will pre-populate with stuff that soldiers have already identified. All right, next slide. And then you can send it out to another company commander who's, well, let's say you're doing the M16 range, or sorry, M4 range, date myself, and the other guy's doing the, I'm gonna call it the M9 range because I can't remember what the new one is. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So you can, get, you can send it out for collaboration. Once everybody's agreed to it, then you send it to your commander for his signature because the commander needs to know what uh, risks he's assuming. And maybe he has a plan for, I use them sometimes to highlight a risk that the commander may not be aware of and get some buy-in from him. Uh, so basically just know that JRAT works about the same, at the same speed, it's a web-based program as DTS. <laughs> so it's gonna take you 15 minutes and 14 of those minutes are watching the circle spin. Next slide, please. So we talked about the risk assessment and how we develop controls, we imp implement controls. The AAR uh, at the end of your range, for instance, is probably uh, the least, the step that's done the least. Did your controls work? Were they successful? All right, next slide. All right, so I said, these are uh, some mishaps that I wanna go over that may be relevant to you. All right, so this is a mixed ammunition mishap. So two weeks prior to the mishap, um, the soldiers of this unit went out and they did a live fire accident. They qualified with their M4s. <clears throat> All right. So at the end of the, the range, um, the platoon leader shook down all the, uh, the members of the squad um, for live ammo. Nobody shook down the platoon leader. Um, so he inadvertently had a full mag uh, left in his, his uh, load carrying equipment. Uh, next slide, please. So the the uh, two weeks after that, they were doing a uh, reactive fire with an op four. So they're out, they're popping up. Uh, one of the op four soldiers engages engages the platoon leader. This is like the third iteration in. The guy does what all good infantry guys are going to do now, without taking his eyes off. He flips out the mag. He slaps a new mag in. Pop pop pop. Two of them hit the, they were live rounds. Two of them hit the guy's sappy plate. The other, guy, the other one went into his chest, killed him. That little bit of inattention, failure to follow the SOP. Maybe the platoon leader was overconfident in his, own, his or her own abilities and assumed that they did everything right. Uh, I haven't had a day in the army yet where I haven't made a mistake. I haven't had a minute in this presentation that I haven't made a mistake. So it's all, it happens, you know. Be especially, particularly careful on range operations, please. Next slide. Uh, mishap firing, reflex uh, firing mishap. Um, so they're out, they're reacting like, okay, shoot this target, shoot that target. Great, exercise goes re really well, no problems there. Then we're all guarding here, right? So we've got two days, usually a drill weekend to knock out our range ops, right? So usually by Sunday morning, everyone who's able to qualify already has. And what do we got? We have 700 rounds left over and we don't wanna turn them in, right? We wanna shoot that shit off so we can collect the brass and get the hell out of there and get back to the armory in some kind of reasonable time. So that's what these guys were doing. The, the reflex training is complete, but they have all these extra rounds to expend. So that's what they're doing. 
they're shooting hundreds of rounds. Uh, like a good platoon leader, they, okay, hey, time out, all right, set the weapons down, walk away from them, give them a chance to cool down because they're doing full auto firing. All right, sustained firing rate, go ahead, next slide, please. Uh, the soldier fired 528 rounds of 5.56 within a seven to eight minute duration, exceeding the sustained fire rate of 12 to 15 rounds per minute by 40%. All right, weapons are on the ground, cooling off, they're policing up brass, doing what you're supposed to do. Rounds cook off, kill, shoot, hit a guy in the chest. The overheated weapon cooked off four times. So, clear the weapon, right? Those little bits of indis indiscipline cost a soldier his life. Think, uh, I'm sure you've all experienced death in your lives. Had a friend that died. Think of that ripple effect of that one death on their parents, their family, their friends. You know, it stays with you forever. And that guy died simply because a simple mistake like that. Next slide, please. All right, so me as a, a, a Blackhawk test pilot, this is what I want you, my passengers, to know. Okay, we harp on FOD. FOD is foreign object debris. These robust, robust $16 million aircraft have some sensitivities. Okay, so our engines right there, they ingest vast amounts of air in order to make the 2,000 shaft horsepower every minute that they, they make. They spin at 21,000 RPM continuously. Think of them as en enormous vacuum cleaners. So if you wear a hat on the flight line and it gets ingested into the engine, the engine will continue to operate, but it will have to be condemned. That, my friends, is $768,000. Happened last year, here. Uh, I believe the budget for Camp Bond Steel is what, three million a month? For aviation, it's a lot more than that. Yeah. But yes. every, everything in Bond Steel, this is unlike any place else in the Army, everything that it takes this place to operate, aviation parts, gas, everything, comes out of the same pot. Yeah. So when they ate that engine last year, uh, other things, services that were available to the soldiers went away. <laughs> uh, our main rotor blades are 200 grand a piece. Uh, so let's say as simple as a uh, platoon leader's got a loading plan in his pocket and it flies out. If it hits one of our pitot tubes, that's the air, the ram air effect is how the computers on board and our instruments measure speed. So the stabilator back here could fail. At 120 knots, if that thing has failed full down, the, that's one of the reputations of the Blackhawk. It becomes a lawn dart. I cannot pull back far enough on the flight controls to keep it from impacting the ground. Literally just happened in the Sinai. Killed eight. So, hey, just do us all a favor. When, this, when the crew chiefs ask you to defod yourselves, I don't care if the sergeant major is telling you to wear your hat, you put that hat in their pocket, okay? Please. Do I have any questions? Because we're wrapping up. Next slide, please. I appreciate your time. Hope I didn't waste it. Thank you very much. Have a great day.